Hey, what's going on? This is Billy Newman, and you're listening to the Billy Newman Photo Podcast for Thursday, October 19th, 2017. Does any of that sound right? Is it the 19th? I think it is. Yeah, it's probably something like that. But today, uh, I'm recording a podcast. I'm in my truck. It's raining really hard. Um, I don't know. Well, you, I'm sure you, I'm sure everybody that's on the West Coast has sort of noticed that. We've had like a really cool week, two weeks, three weeks of October so far that have been really nice or, you know, generally pretty, pretty good weather. And I think even like Monday through the next week is going to be pretty nice also. So hopefully you have a good Halloween weekend coming up in just a little over a week. I hope that we, uh, we still get at least some dry weather before it kicks into that nasty, wet, rainy weather of Oregon in the winter. But it's weird kind of trying or starting to the transition back into the real fall season that we get here in Oregon with uh, with all the water, all the rain, all the wetness and stuff. But uh, I don't think I'm looking forward to it, really. I need more summer. I think this one went by a little too fast this year. So hopefully there's something we can do to uh, to lighten the load and, and figure it out this year. But man, isn't it a drudge the next like, what, two, three months? Not October. Probably not the first part of November, but man, the last, well, yeah, the last half of November, I think that's why, you know, everybody says that's why we have the holidays during that time, but man, daylight savings time ending, going back to standard time, super dark in the morning, super dark in the evenings, ugh, I'm not too excited about any of it, but, um, but yeah, it's kind of a weird part with the the changing of the seasons as it's coming in, and it's weird being uh, deep into fall now, watching the colors and the trees start to change quite a bit. You know, outside of my house, I, I talked about it a little bit, but there's uh, there's two of these maple trees. One of them goes off, goes off, like it turns orange or it starts to turn colors uh, and drop its leaves about two weeks earlier than the tree next to it does. So right now there's one tree that's a maple that's nearly dropped all of its leaves, but then the tree right next to it is now just starting to turn its leaves like it's I think most of it's green and it's just starting to turn to red and then to yellow but it's kind of cool to get to see just these two slightly different varieties of maple trees next to each other kind of grow so differently to their understanding of the almanac like their organisms their species understanding of when what temperature you know what to do um so it's kind of a weird thing maybe it's uh, the same type of tree maybe it's but I don't think so. I think it's kind of a different microclimate between the two of them, and it's a different variety. And, you know, it's interesting, too. In the springtime, one tree will bloom two weeks before, the, or the same tree that, that loses its leaves early, it will bloom early in the spring when it comes around. So it's kind of interesting when you, you sort of notice those little eccentricities of things in nature and how, how their, their cycles kind of come at certain times. But today I have a couple photographs to talk about that have gone up on Instagram and other places in uh, the social media world. You can check those out uh, at Billy Newman on Instagram. There's a couple cool ones out there. Actually, I'm, I'm kind of happy with, uh, with some of the stuff I've been doing. You know, I've been really busy with photo stuff and it might be one of the more successful months of, of doing little photo things that, uh, that have been around for a while. So really happy about that part. But uh, this last week I made a trip out to Central Oregon and it was still really nice. You know, we had a little bit of rain, I think, out there last Thursday, Friday. And then Saturday, Sunday, we it just it just brightened up a ton. It was super crisp out, super bright, really cold, though. Uh, I think my friend Dave had just gone out uh, to Eastern Oregon, I think out towards Smith Rock. And he said it was super cold out there, too. But, yeah, this trip, uh, we did like an overnight trip out there. And I think... Today, I just posted a photograph of, uh, of something I thought was really cool. It's one of the archaeological remains that are out in eastern Oregon. And, and there's a whole interesting history about stuff in eastern Oregon. Um, but the photo that I posted to Instagram and to, you know, to Facebook and all the other places today is, is a photograph of this rock teepee ring that's still in very good condition. It's out in eastern Oregon in this area uh, in between uh, sort of near like where a dry lake bed or once just a lake would have been now what we see in our modern time is just a dry lake bed but the cool thing is is as we kind of look around you can see the remnants of an old indian camp that was really quite established in that area i think it's it's just amazing to get to go see and you'll find other artifacts uh from indian populations out in eastern oregon once you start looking around like you'll start noticing um, obsidian chips that are on the ground or you'll start noticing um Really, in like some places, you, through a lot of Oregon, through a lot of the the less developed, uh, less forested areas of eastern Oregon, there's a, there's a lot less erosion that's taken place, natural erosion that's taken place over the last few hundred years. Like over here on the west side of the coast, with all the the deciduous plant um, matter that comes up, 
there's a lot of turnover that seems to happen. Like um, a lot of the vegetation is going to end up hiding or overgrowing some of the older um, encampments or establishments that were made. I mean, right now I'm in the Camas Valley. I'm in the Willamette Valley where the uh, Kalapuya Indians were. I'm sure out here in front of me in this big field out toward the Willamette River, there's tons of Indian artifacts, tons of old Indian camps, but none of that's really visible because of all the deciduous organic material that's been developed over here over the many hundreds of years since it's been that there was an Indian population in the area. Now, what's interesting about Eastern Oregon is that because it's way more remote, there's very few people out there. There's very few people to disturb a lot of things. And really, sagebrush doesn't grow, grow very fast. Uh, things don't really move around very fast out there. I was there, I think, maybe more than a decade ago, and it was really almost the same as it is now. Very little has changed out there. You know, there's no new houses, no new development, maybe a, maybe a fence around the thing. That might be it. Um, but it was really cool. So you get out to this area. You hike out to a spot, and you can really see all over the ground. It's just a ton of black obsidian chunks, these unworked pieces of black obsidian that were carried in by people and then dropped there at some point. And all these pieces were used, I think, in the, in the, in the camp to, to chip out arrowheads and to chip out other tools that they would use. But it's really cool. This TP ring is really the, the only... Um, well, there's a few teepee rings, like uh, a few smattering of like of, of piles of rocks. This teepee ring was really the one that was uh, that was the most established. Still, it was the most upright still. And you wonder, like, how far back did these go? Like, how far back did these uh, these stones that were laid into the ground go? But they would use it sort of like as a foundation for for the tent or the hut of the teepee that they they would have established there. And then they would you know work out of it. And they worked out of it on a bluff, and then they would look out over the the hill to the lake area and yeah i don't know they just had a whole system out there but it's really amazing when you really start to uh to come in and, and sort of understand the layout of the land and, and where people would sort of go and it's very interesting man surreal really to get out and like be in a spot like that or sit in a spot sit in the center of the teepee ring where you know there's people other men thousands of years ago that were doing work and trying to survive out in really what is now a very harsh environment and back then was still probably quite harsh, <laughs> uh, at least in the hundreds of years ago. But man, if you start going back thousands of years, even a few hundred years ago, I guess 500 years ago, a lot of those dry lake areas out in eastern Oregon really still had at least a marsh or at least a wetland or, uh, or something like that. I mean, like similar to Summer Lake now, you know, parts of the year it's dry, parts of the year it's, it's filled with water. Um, so it, it might be quite a bit more like that now, but I think in the past it was really, uh, it, was, it was just accepted that there was going to be some amount of water in, in the lake bed all year round instead of it being, you know, a dry lake bed. And I think it's, I think it's supported by the watershed of a few creeks that are in the area. And, and out in that area of Eastern Oregon, there's really, I don't think there's really that many, that many drainages that really go all the way out toward the coast. Um, so I think there's a few parts that are like landlocked watersheds where the water flows into an area and then, and then kind of pools up and makes a large lake there. And, um, well, I know like there's the Klamath Lake and then that runs out to the Klamath River. So that, that ends up getting out to the, to the ocean. But I don't know if like places like Goose Lake or, uh, or just like these inland lake areas, I think they're just fed by the body of water. And I don't really know if a lot of that would actually get back out into the water cycle to, to head back out toward the ocean and then, you know, come back up or something. So it's kind of interesting thinking about uh, just some of the, the old watershed stuff that used to be out there, how populations used to try and try and work around all that. You know, like you go out to a place like Fort Rocky and you read some of the signs and you look at uh, how back in the Pleistocene area, they, that whole region out there was part of, a, I think, what's called a Pluvian Lake. Uh, it's like a prehistoric Pleistocene era lake um, that really took up a huge amount of land out in central Oregon. Really what we think of now is just a large desert area covered with sagebrush with really very few land features it was actually just all underwater. The, the land feature of Fort Rock that we visualize now, I think came about uh, geologically during the Pleistocene era, era before, before, the, uh, before the Ice Age and, and probably a, a while back before that. But during that time, it was underwater. It was under a lake bed. And so that's where you get that formation is it was underwater and then it kind of eroded around it, this aquifer and lava or a aquifer or magma, I don't know, it met at a certain time and made this big ring, this big uh, 
this big Fort Rock style formation. And that's still what's out there now. But it's really amazing when you get out there and you go see it. And then you kind of start to reckon with the perspective that this all was once underwater. This was like an inland sea. And then after the Ice Age or before the Ice Age, there's some evidence of kind of, a, well, I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, there's evidence to show that uh, the Clovis people, the Clovis tribes, which I think were, were the ones that at least in modern archaeology have been identified as the group that was first to come over the land bridge, first to come into the northwest and populate uh, parts of the west coast and into the south and onward and such. But I guess these Clovis people had a, had like a specific type of, of way of, of building their tools or stone tools that they would use. And that's a, a bit of a way that you can track some things. Is if you do find an archaeological artifact, you can kind of identify by the technique used to build the stone tool. Like there's, uh, there's different measures. I think one of the oldest ones that's looked for is fluting. Um, and that was a, a technique used by the Clovis people where they would... They would sort of make an, an arrowhead or a spear point, really spear points. I don't know if they had they had flying bows and arrows at that time that far back, but they they build these spear points and they would flute the end, the bottom of it. So like if you were to imagine, um, they would be kind of this concaved uh, slope that was, that was sort of dremeled out of the bottom base of the rock so that you could you could kind of fit that down in the center of a of a stick, really, and then and then wind that up. So you kind of make both ends. Uh, kind of taper off to a point and then you would jam one end into the stick and then wrap it and then I don't know you know put sap on it or or, or you know whatever you could do to to, to fasten it down um, but I guess that was one of the techniques that was used early on and that's one of the the things that they look for when they're trying to find really old populations in Oregon sometimes it's fluting that doesn't always mean that it's really old though I suppose but I guess there was like handfuls of uh, of different technical or technological generations of, of stone tool building out there. And you can kind of tell a little bit, but it's very fascinating stuff. And man, was it not amazing to get out there and to really recognize that, you know, I was around uh, a natural human man-made, well, a semi-natural, but man-made artifact of, uh, of a home or of an establishment that's as old, I don't know how old it is. Maybe it's as old as early Rome, late Rome? Who would know how old it is in comparison to Europe? I'm not really sure. Maybe it goes back even further than that. It seems like there was population uh, in that area of Oregon for thousands of years. I think, was it the Paiute that was out there? Could be different, but I know the Paiute, the Paiute were south of that area. The Paiute were in Lake County, I think like through Heart Mountain, Alvord, Nevada, the Malheur area, all of that was Paiute. So maybe this was still in the Paiute section. But I know that that really, you know, like what we've noticed in the last few hundred years, if you were to uh, to look at the changes of a map, even within the United States over the last, say, take 600 years, not even 7,000 years. Take the last, last 600 years of the United States of America and then look at all the different maps that would be the territorial ranges of those people who ended up being in power during that time. It's really interesting to see and to kind of take note to how something that seems permanent or seems to have the nature of permanence in it when you speak about it like the that was the range of the Paiute Indian well was it for 600 years or for that long did it move around did they have I don't know territorial engagements was there really that many of them were they there all the time I don't know any of that information so it's kind of interesting when you sort of think about it, but it could have been any number of large groups of people that probably would have no idea they were called the Paiute Indian. Um, but all really very interesting stuff. And man, was it so cool to get out there and, uh, and see, uh, see a real uh, a teepee ring. It's really fun. It's one of the, the cooler pieces of uh, archaeological artifacts that I've run into. I mean, you know, you see uh, petroglyphs, you see a lot of things, but really, you know you were sitting in the home of someone that lived thousands of years ago. That lived out in the same place that, that I do now. You know, really fascinating stuff. But I had a blast going out there and, uh, and getting to check it out. Uh, and it was really, I don't know, I just, I love, I kind of love this stuff with the, with the story, with the background to it, where you kind of get to attach something that you recognize with it, with, uh, with what you get to talk about or what you get to show with it. Uh, so I thought it was a really cool story. It was, it was really fun to get out there and go see it. I remembered it from years ago. I think I'd seen it about 10 or 11, 12 years ago. And uh, I think I had tried to go back to it, but I didn't really see how to or where it was. And I wasn't really sure. It's not something on the map, as they say. So 
I think that's most of everything for the Billy Newman Photo Podcast. You can check out a few of the other photos that have gone up on Instagram in the last couple of days. I think there's a couple of good ones. Maybe I'll backtrack and talk about those in the next podcast, but this one's pretty cool. I'm glad I got to talk a little bit about some of the stuff out in Central Oregon, some of the uh, the old lakes out there, and man, some of the cool artifacts that you can get to find. But uh, but yeah, that uh, that teepee ring is pretty rad. It's cool to see. Hope you guys get a chance to check it out at Billy Newman on Instagram, uh, billynewmanphoto.com if you want to check out more of my stuff. And yeah, going to be doing some networking events this week. I'm going to start uh, talking to people. Who knew that was part of business, right? Anyway, <laughs> that's that's it for this episode of the Billy Newman Photo Podcast. On behalf of nobody, thank you very much for listening to me talk to myself in the rain in my car. <laughs>